You know what? God is so funny. Eh? You know, I've prepared like 800 pages of notes here. And uh, it's nearly lunchtime already. <laughs> and he's also quite funny because, you know, this is how he works. If he sends uh, somebody into battle, you know, and you're going to choose the, the guy at the front, you're going to search for a special forces guy who, who looks the deal. He's going to look fit. He's going to look tough. He's not going to give up. He's going to, you'll just tell by his jawbone that he's got that, that grit. And uh, that's the guy you will choose to lead the army. But God doesn't do that. He goes to someone like Gideon, a skinny guy hiding behind the wine press, skinny little legs probably, and says, you are going to lead the army. And he says, you must be joking. And God says, because I'm with you, you're going to do it. And he always chooses, um, you know, like he chose Moses and said, you're going to go and speak to Pharaoh. Moses said, I, I can't speak, I, I, I stammer, I'm not gonna, I, I can't speak. He said, I'll be with you, you're going to go. And Jeremiah, he says, you will go and speak my words. And he said, I'm a child, I can't speak. But God says, don't say I'm a child, I'm with you. You will say everything I tell you to say. And I'm just saying that because I think he's funny, because I know me, you don't know me, maybe like, well, of course you don't know me like I know me, but <clears throat> I do not speak, and I have a phobia for public speaking. Uh, at school, I, I was a, a prefect, and we had to read from the Bible just every now and then. And I, I was absolutely terrified. I, and we could choose the passage, thankfully. And I didn't know God. I, I, I did know Him, but I didn't walk. I didn't understand. So I thought, what's the smallest passage in the Bible? And somehow I found 3 John 16. For God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son that whosoever should believe in Him would not perish but have eternal life. And then sat down. I was, it was quite a good thing I said. <laughs> and, and I spoke at weddings, and, and uh, the second time I was best man, I had to speak, and I, I, I went blank, and I thought, oh, I'm making such a fool of myself. And I've been in, in interviews where I was speaking to the guy, and I asked him a question, and I said, and what about, and he was looking at me, and then suddenly I froze, and I, I forgot what I was going to say, and uh, I didn't get the job. <laughs> and then he asked me to speak. So... God is funny. And you know, uh, everything that's happened today, is this working? Everything that's happened today is just, is just a confirmation of the word that I had from God, which just pleases me so much. And, and I wanted to talk about God is love, and that without faith we can't please Him. And that uh, there was a word in, in the pre, uh, service prayer meeting that we wanted people to worship and to be touched by God and to cry and to be healed in the worship and I wanted to try and explain some things and then <clears throat> we'd worship and I was going to say now just go and be with God but we've done it already <laughs> <laughs> so anyway I want to uh, speak to you today you know there's a scripture in Psalm 42 7 that says deep calls to deep and uh, I may not be deep but I have someone living in me called the Holy Spirit who is deep and so do you, because you believe in Jesus. So when, when you hear someone speaking the truth, something in you just leaps around. Something called your spirit just leaps around saying, that's true, that's true, that's so right. Oh, that's, uh, you know, you listen to Bill Johnson or Greg. <laughs> the same. <laughs> and what they're saying, it just makes you so happy. And at the end, you say, what, what, was, what was the preaching about? You say, I don't know, but it was so good. And it was your spirit your spirit responding to, to their spirit. And, and uh, what happens there? The scripture says in, uh, in, in 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 15 to 16, that, that we have the mind of Christ. At the end of it, it says we have the mind of Christ and that the Holy Spirit will teach you all things. So you know all things. And that's why when you, when you hear truth, you, you just respond to it. And uh, God is a spirit, and like we said, I said last time, uh, we've got to worship him, worship him in spirit and in truth. We can't contact him with our physical mind. We have to worship him in spirit. And uh, let's start then with that in mind. Basically, God is good. We hear that said, and it might annoy some people to say God is good. Somebody just died yesterday, and where is God good? 
But basically, to receive from God, you have to understand and know Him. And if you know Him, you will know that He is good. You know, He's a gentleman. He never forces anybody. I like the way Reinhard Bonke said it. He said that when you were born, nobody asked your permission to be born. You were just born into whatever family. But to be born again, he asks your permission. He forces nobody. Um, and this is where God is all-powerful, but because he is love, his, his will doesn't come to pass sometimes because you have a choice. And the Bible says that God is love in, in 1 John 4 verse 8. That he is love. Not that he, he just loves, but he is love. And what is love? 1 Corinthians 13 is the love uh, chapter. It's one of my favorite chapters. Actually, when I look at the Bible, whatever I'm looking at might become my favorite chapter. You know, John 14, <clears throat> Jesus says, In my Father's house are many mansions. I go and prepare a place for you. And I'll come back for you and I'll take you then. That, that's just, I want to go now. Or Psalm 23, I love that. I want to lie on the green pasture next to the beautiful still waters with him. Psalm 27 is another one <clears throat> that I've hidden in my heart. The one thing I seek, Lord, and that is, is, is your face, to gaze at the beauty of it and inquire in your temple. But let's look at 1 Corinthians 13 from verse 4 onwards. I don't know if you can bring these up. So we know that God is love. And here it says, love is patient, love is kind. Let's change love to God. This whole chapter is speaking about God and His character, the nature of God. God is patient. God is kind. He does not envy. He does not boast. He is not rude. He is not self-seeking. He is not easily angered. And He keeps no record of wrongs. You know, we walk around in church sometimes as Christians and we've, we're so sin conscious, we're so conscious of everything we've done wrong that we can't receive from God. David, before Jesus had even come, had a revelation of God's grace. He didn't have God's grace yet, but he acquired it because he knew God was good. And he spoke about um, the blessed is the man to whom God does not impute sin. Love does not delight in evil. God does not delight in evil, but rejoices with the truth. He always protects. He always trusts. He always hopes. And he also always perseveres. So I say again, God is good. And his plans for you are very, very good. He's got very, very good plans for you. And uh, for you to step into your plans, you need to get a few miracles from him. No, we can know him and live the blessed life, and life is good. But if you're going to follow into his plans, you're going to need miracles. So, you know, I could say, anyone need a miracle here? Yes. Anybody? <laughs> we should all put up our hands, because if we step into God's plan for us, the plan will be so big that you cannot do it on your own. You will need a miracle. And how do you get a miracle from God? Now, God is, is not willing that any should perish and that everyone that calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. There's an example of His will does not always come to pass because He doesn't want anyone to perish, but some do perish because they don't choose Him. Because He, he is love, He will not force you. Love cannot force you to do anything. You know, the fear of God is the beginning of wisdom. Yes, we understand that. And the fear of God brings you there. It's like touching the stove. It burns you. Oh, I'm not going to do that again. The fear of God, we look and we see if we don't choose, and that's the first thing we understand. Hell is waiting for us. No, we don't want that, so we go to God. But once we go to Him, we find out that He is so good, that He is love, that His plans are so good for us, that we, we leave behind the fear of God. That was the beginning of wisdom. And we move over into love and, and take Him as a father. You know, the one thing about love is it cannot be forced. It has to be given freely. And uh, I remember when I was young, <clears throat> I think I was in love when I was like three, four years old, just listening to music. Because all these love songs, and I used to think, oh, you know, I'd listen to like the Carpenters. I don't know if any of you know this. <laughs> and the songs were so sad. I was like sad. I thought, oh, I feel so sad. I feel like my girlfriend's left me. I haven't got a girlfriend. 
I feel like she's left me and I'm so sad. And, and you know, um, there, there was this poster that says, uh, if you love something, set it free. If it comes back to you, it was yours. If it doesn't come back to you, it never was yours. And I thought, oh, if my girlfriend doesn't come back to me, she was never mine anyway. Oh, it's so sad. And, but it's true, isn't it? <laughs> Now, God created you and me, and he set us into the world with free will. Because of Adam, we're all on the wrong side of, we're all on the sin side. But he set us with free will, and he wants us to choose him in love. There's no forcing. Let's look at this in the natural. There's a young couple dating. Let's say the boy is madly in love with the girl, or vice versa, whichever way you know it as. The boy is madly in love with the girl. Who has the power in that relationship? The one in love or the one not in love? The one not in love will do this and the other one will jump <laughs> like a puppet on a string. Will just do whatever because he's in love. Oh, he's in love. He'll say, eat the whole apple because it's, you have to eat the whole apple because I told you to. He'll say, I don't want to eat the apple. The pips taste horrible. You eat it if you love me. <laughs> you eat it. <laughs> like an idiot. Is this Okay. And so we understand that. You see, love and power don't go together. If you love, you have no power. God wants you to work for Him, to choose Him because you, because you want to, not because you have to. Now, I remember the Rocky movie. Uh, you know the boxing movie, Rocky. Rocky became uh, the champion and now suddenly he had money. And he was with his brother, Paulie. And they were poor guys, but now he was rich. And he bought Paul Lee, his brother, a nice, expensive watch. And then they were in the back of this alley having an argument. And Paul Lee said, oh, you have your stupid watch back. You only bought it because you had to, you know, because I'm, I'm your wife's brother. And Rocky said in his, his, his English, he said, no, I didn't do. I don't do because I have to. I do because I want to, you know. And I thought, uh, that's, that's a God thing. That, that's exactly what God wants you to do it. He doesn't want you to do it because you have to do it. He doesn't want you putting money in this bag that goes around because you have to. It's wise to put in there because you, you position yourself in the, in the stream where he sees, ah, oh, these people will give, I'm going to give more to them. So it's wise and it's almost selfish to put money in the bag. But don't put money in the bag because you are, are scared. Because anything that's done not in love profits you nothing. That, that's also from... Uh, that love chapter in 1 Corinthians uh, 13. Another example now, if, if you're driving along and the police officer is pointing the radar at you, oh, you've been caught speeding, he pulls you over. You pull over because you have to. He has power over you. If you don't listen to him, <clears throat> he could uh, put you in jail. He's going to give you a big fine. You do something then because you have to, not because you want to. So that's power. There's no love involved in, in, the, in the speeding ticket. And if we look at, at our mums, let, let's say John with his mum there. If, if John's mum wants him to do something, she can't force him to do anything. You know, she can't say, John, you will take the rubbish out, you will vacuum this carpet. If, if they had a fight, John, John could whip her, you know. <laughs> he could. He doesn't have to listen to her. But does he listen to her? Yes. She has no power over him. But because of the thousands of acts of sacrificial love that she has done for him over the years as he grew, grew up, because of her loving acts of sacrificial love, he does for her because he wants to. Love is involved. She has no power over him, but she has great power, if you want to say, because he loves her. Do you love her? <laughs> and now we look at um, what's happened in, in uh, <clears throat> Libya now Gaddafi has been killed Proverbs 21 verse 28 says that love and faithfulness keep a king safe and through love his throne is made secure <coughs> God's kingdom is of love if only leaders took this advice you know, Gaddafi said my people love me my people love me but if they say anything else, they, get, they go missing. And 
God's word is just true. He who lives by the sword dies by the sword. You know, it's just, the dictators should just look at history. The only thing they learn from history is that they learn nothing from history. God's word is so true. And, uh, you know, even though he died and he was a bad guy, Jesus even teaches us not to rejoice over the death of our enemies. His word will make you wise. His word makes wise the simple. That's in, in Proverbs as well. I like to be like Eric, uh, you say, in the Bible. It says, and I'm not sure of the exact place. <laughs> you see, we, we have a king who's not a dictator. We have a king who is love. We have a king who is our father. And he's coming back actually to be our bridegroom and you're going to be the bride. And he doesn't want to come back for a miserable sour-faced bride. He wants to come back for one that loves him and knows him. So in Jesus we find a revelation of one who gave up his power, came into our world to fix the problem of sin by becoming a loving sacrifice for us and making a way back to God for us. And he forces no one because he is love. He cannot force anyone. So, you know, God is all-powerful. He can do anything, but he doesn't do everything. Jesus said, when I'm lifted up from the earth, I will draw all men to myself. You know, when he's lifted up on the cross, when you truly see what he has done, when you truly see, I mean, we see dimly now, but from what little that we can see, when we see that what he has done, what, that he's up on the cross dying for you, you can only fall headlong into love for him and want that kingdom. And this is where we start to understand uh, the greatest commandment. Matthew 22, verse 37 to 40. Jesus replied, Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your mind. And this is the first and greatest commandment. And the second is like it. Love your neighbor as yourself. All the law and the prophets hang on these two commands. If you love God and you love other people, you would not break any of the other commands. That's all you have to do is love God and love people. If you love people, you'd never steal, you'd never lie. You wouldn't commit adultery because you'd be hurting your, your spouse and you'd be hurting the one you're committing adultery with. You wouldn't do anything wrong if you could follow those. The truth is we can't follow them, so don't be condemned, but we try to. So God is good. And good things happen to people who believe that God is good. I believe that when we start talking about Jesus and how good he is, the place fills with angels. There's like a grandstand and they all just start to come and sit and they're just waiting to be given orders to minister to you, to make you able to walk in your destiny. Now we look at, at, at Abraham. <clears throat> he, was, uh, he was, I think it was about 400 and something years before the Ten Commandments came. He's just walking along in the desert somewhere in the area of Iraq between the Tigris and the Euphrates rivers. God came to him and said, uh, Abraham, he had a relationship with God. And basically what he said to him in Genesis 15, 16, 17, and 18 is that, Abraham, I will bless you. I'll give you a son, and through you all the offspring of my people will be born. And I'll be with you, and I'll bless you. Abraham believed God, it says, and it was credited to him as righteousness. Believing that God is good, that he will bless you. Look how blessed Abraham was. You know, he was with Lot, his son-in-law, and they became too many in numbers, and they were quarreling over the, the animals, and they said, we need to separate. He went up on a hill, and he said to Lot, I'm going to go one way, you go the other way. Which side do you want? And one side was all lush and green, and the other side was desert. So Lot said, I'll take the green. Abraham said, okay. And he took the, the desert, because he knew God was with him. And the desert turns into an oasis for him, because God is with him. Abraham made many mistakes. He was not perfect. He went into another land and he was with his, his wife who was uh, so beautiful that the king would take her. That's what they did. They saw a nice girl, they'd take them, show them to the king and he would take the best looking girl. So he said, just say you're my, my sister because otherwise they'll kill me. He, he didn't even look after her. He did, he did many, a, many a, a wrong thing. But when we look at uh, Hebrews 11, the chapter of faith, God says that, he doesn't see any of the mistakes about David and Abraham. and He just said Abraham was known as the friend of God. 
Abraham was a man who believed that God was good, is what I'm trying to get across. David was another one who knew that God was good. He made terrible mistakes as well. He was a great guy, but like all of us, you are great people and we make mistakes. I can't believe I'm here talking because I'm not faithful. I fail regularly. I fail regularly. I try not to and I fail regularly. And God still comes to me and still looks after me. And uh, I have a testimony which I'll tell you about. But God is so good. The Apostle John was the, the Apostle who wrote. He was described as the Apostle whom Jesus loved. And he wrote that. Because <laughs> he wrote his own uh, book of John, you know. And he, he says the, the Apostle who Jesus loved. Something good about knowing how Jesus loves you. He knew that God was good. And he, had a, he, had, he, probably, he did have the best life of the Apostles. All the others got torn in half and crucified upside down and John was the only one who died a natural death on the island of Patmos and uh, he even survived being boiled John knew that God was good you have to know that God is good that his plans for you are very good but now there comes the thing there are two things in scripture stated in scripture that God cannot do do you, do you know of two things that God cannot do anyone Lie. Yeah, he cannot lie. Well done, Smiley. He cannot be pleased without faith. faith. Hebrews 11, verse 6, And without faith it is impossible to please God. Because anyone who comes to him must believe that he exists and that he rewards those who earnestly seek him. His rewards. It's not just a scraping through life. We'll get there at the end. You will be blessed beyond measure and you will be a blessing to others. So, everything he says here in the Bible is true, and we must believe it. He has so many promises for us. Faith is important. Now, <clears throat> that was my part. I, I'm very proud of that. God helped me with that. <laughs> and I, I, I love, uh, I love, I listen to so many different preachers, and I just love them all. And this, this was, uh, I got this from uh, Bill Johnson and I just love his teaching it's so so good that like I said everything he says I think oh, it's so good that's so good but he's got too much I can only listen to two or three sentences and I, I need to concentrate on that for like three months it was so good it was so good so I was I was really down uh, about a month ago I was I was so down and uh, I've got a I had a problem and I'm sitting there thinking uh, what what can I do and uh, <clears throat> God helps me with a holiday in, in August at the friend's house. I don't pay a thing. I'm in a beautiful spot looking over Fig Tree Bay. And I'm sitting on my lounge and I'm looking at these little sparrows. And there's about, I think I counted them, there's about 18 little house sparrows all on the grass eating. It was, it was about 8 o'clock in the morning. And I thought... Uh, God reminded me of that scripture where he says, don't worry about your life. Look at the birds of the air, how nobody feeds them, yet they've got food. Your father cares for them. How much more will he care for you? I'm looking at the little birds eating. I can't see the food, but there's food there. And I just felt he's going to look after me. And I've got this plan. When I look at what I need for this plan, it's impossible. But God's going to look after me. So... The next thing that happens is somebody comes to me and, and offers me this great assistance. And uh, God is good. I will tell you more about it. <laughs> so, <clears throat> Bill, Bill was talking about this, but, but he's got the Holy Spirit in him, and he's just speaking what the Holy Spirit is saying, and you will hear it, and you will just understand it deep to deep, because the Holy Spirit lives in you. That faith is the currency of heaven. Faith is what pulls down from heaven all those resources that you need. If you don't believe, you won't receive. God's resources are not moved from heaven to earth because of human need. You know, uh, listen to this. Uh, Jesus was provided because the Father saw human need. He provided Jesus. He came himself to provide for our need. He sent his word and healed us. By his stripes we were healed. He made a way back 
to heaven and we can start our eternal life now and live the good life from now if we draw on the resources of heaven because our Father in heaven has, owns a cattle on a thousand hills. He has so much resources. He can get you what you need. So, Jesus was the provision provided for the human need and now it is faith in what was provided that moves the resource. It is no longer the human need. If human need was what, was what moved the resources from heaven, then the poorest places would be the, the richest places later. We look at India and there's so many poor people, or Africa, or even in Cyprus, there's poor people. And you say, well, why doesn't, uh, doesn't God care about the poor people? Of course He cares about the poor people. But He's provided Jesus. You have to choose Jesus and He will pull you up. It seems unreasonable when someone comes along with a testimony, you know, like a Christian will come along, I heard of a guy going to a prison, <clears throat> talking to the prisoners and said, oh, on the way here I was driving my new car and the other car in front picked up a stone and it chipped my windscreen and it's a new car. And I stopped and I put my hand on the windscreen and I prayed God to fix this and He fixed it. And the prisoners are looking at him like, God cares about windscreens. He doesn't care about us in jail and uh, people are dying. and cares about windscreens. Well, this is a trivial matter, you know, the windscreen. But that person has a relationship with God. And he can draw on, on things from heaven where if you don't have a relationship with him, you can't draw on, on things from heaven. You know, it, it's that thing where Jesus said uh, to the people at the end of time, they all came to him and he said, away from me. And they said, what? Didn't we do many mighty things in your name? Matthew 7, verse 21 onwards. Didn't we do many things in your name? And he says, away from me. I never knew you. We have to know him, don't we? And knowing him, if you know him, you know that he is love. So the, the resources of heaven are not released because people are sitting in their room depressed, complaining, nobody cares about me. You know, self-pity is, is from the devil. It, will, it, it leaves a smell, I believe, and, and the, the Beelzebub, you know, he's the king of flies. That's describing the devil, and, and what are flies attracted to? Death and decay. Things like self-pity just leave an odor that the devil and his demons come. It's so dangerous. So you're complaining, nobody cares about me. And God is saying, now this is the next thing, um, lift your head. Lift your head up. Why? So that the King of Glory may come in. You say, well, doesn't he care for the brokenhearted? Yes. Yes, he does care for the brokenhearted. And have you noticed that when you first became a Christian, he will care for you. You can be a baby. He will come to you and... Uh, Look at it with mothers with their little babies. We take great delight. Eleanor with her Calliope. She takes great delight in changing her nappy. Little baby's got a spoiled nappy. She doesn't want to leave it. She'll get a rest. She cries. Mummy comes quickly, changes the nappy, makes her comfortable. Oh, oh. And she, she even enjoys changing a nappy, I dare say, because she brings relief to her little baby. And that's what we like as a Christian when we first believe. We're a little baby, and God doesn't mind you being depressed and sad. He's teaching you. But when Calliope becomes 12 years old, <laughs> Eleanor doesn't want to change a nappy at 12. We're going to give her a hiding. Say, do not spoil your nappy. Go to the toilet. So, you know, as we are a Christian, as we go on, we don't want to be... A Christian, how long have you been a Christian? Ten years and you're still down in the dumps. It's not honoring to God. He wants you to grow and not be a baby that needs oh, 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 oh every day. You be the person that goes to someone and does the oh, oh. Okay. There's a scripture that says, lift your eyes to the hills. From where does my help come? My help comes from the Lord, the maker of heaven and earth. So we're trying to help somebody here who's feeling down or depressed or struggling. It's in Psalm 24, verse 7 and 8, where it says, lift up your heads, O your gates, and be lifted up your ancient doors, that the King of glory may come in. So it's very easy to lift your head and praise God. If you've just won the World Cup rugby, 
You're so happy. You're so happy. It's very easy to thank God. If you just won the lottery, thank you God. It's so easy to be grateful. It's very difficult to be grateful when you're down in the, in the problem. But that is the time when, when God can work the greatest. When everything is going wrong, that's the time to lift your head. Oh, you gates. Why? So that the King of Glory can come in. Lift your head. If your head is down, you're attracting the elves above the Lord of the Flies. And that's not good. So we get this part about lifting our heads. But let's look at the gates. God's talking about the gates there. What are the gates? Isaiah 60 verse 18 says, But you will call your walls salvation and your gates praise. You know, the, that which protects protects you is your salvation. When you believed in God, you got the helmet of salvation. If you die, if you don't understand another thing, if you die, you're going to heaven. So that's good. You've got the ticket. But you have no victory in life. You just have salvation. But his, his gates are praise. That's why this praise this morning was very important. Praise is what opens the gate and lets God come in and rescue you. And Psalm 82 verse 2 says, the, love Lord, the Lord loves the gates of Zion more than all the other dwelling places of Israel. He talks about gates also in Revelation 21 verse 21. And he's describing the new Jerusalem. The new Jerusalem will come down from heaven and join with earth. And heaven will join with earth and earth will be as it should be. And it's going to be a beautiful place. And this Jerusalem is described. It has 12 gates. And the 12 gates says we're 12 pearls and each gate is made up of a single pearl so what is all this teaching us we, we're talking about praise gates and pearls we know about praise gates is the door that God can come in we are the gates if we praise we lift our heads and the pearl what is the pearl well how is a pearl formed it's irritation isn't it an oyster gets a little bit of sand in it and it's irritation, and it covers that piece of sand with a substance that over time, it turns that irritation into a beautiful pearl of great price that people, you know, seek after. So by irritation, you see that the bad circumstance that you are facing will be turned into a testimony. So if you are down and miserable, you have a chance to lift your head, praise God, turn that miserable situation into a, a happy testimony. To take the opportunity of exalting him in the middle of conflict, poverty, depression. When something happens to you that really hurts you, you stop and say, God, in the middle of this I give you thanks. I don't care how it looks at the moment. Your love and kindness is new every morning. You are for me and not against me. You've already set the stage for me to be victorious. Let's praise Him in the hard circumstance. So that, that, that was what I wanted to talk about. Was know that God is good. Know that God is love. He does not force anyone. You choose Him out of love. Praise Him in the bad circumstance. In fact, even if, 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 you, if you're having a, a bad circumstance, you're in depression, it's an opportunity to make that pearl of great price. And I wanted to say now when we worship... Don't worship with your head down. You know, people who are depressed, they'll come to worship and they'll be so sad. Lift your head so that the King of Glory may come in. I think we still have a few songs. Do we? So thank you, Lord, for your word today. Thank you that you have taken church this morning and, and just done with it what you wanted, Lord. Thank you that you have sent our pastor and Philip and Chris and Paul, sorry, Paul <laughs> and Eric. <laughs> the other side of the world, they don't have to go there, Lord, but you are so good. And as I was saying earlier, that Greg cannot go to America, but he can because you are with him. He didn't have the resources in the natural, but in the spiritual, he has resources and he cannot live in that nice house he lives in but because you are good he does live in that nice house that he lives in Lord 
He is an example to us, Lord, of someone who knows that God is good.